Hi, I'm Jeanette Roche. This is Bridge City News. Here are some of the top stories we've been following. Canadians caught in Taiwan's strongest earthquake in 25 years describe scenes of chaos. Plus, as spring snowy conditions sweep across Alberta, central Canada is also left under a blanket of white following Wednesday's snowstorm. And the province announces a funding boost for 10 regional airports, including Lethbridge. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Jeanette Roche. Thanks so much for joining us. The search for bodies and those stranded continues in Taiwan today following a 7.2 magnitude earthquake that occurred early Wednesday morning. Canadians caught in the country's strongest quake in 25 years are describing scenes of chaos, including a shaking so violent and persistent that their furniture moved and required people to crouch down to avoid falling over. Former Ottawa resident Jonathan McGill, a Canadian expat who has been living and working in Taiwan for seven years, says earthquakes in that part of the world are quite normal, but Wednesday's quake made him feel paralyzed with fear, although it lasted only about two minutes. It woke me up out of a deep sleep. I'm so used to it. I I hate to say it, but I was, I was like, oh, it's another earthquake and it'll pass. And I just laid there and it didn't pass and it got stronger and stronger. And I basically became almost paralyzed with fear. It's that almost that fl that fight or flight, you know, syndrome, right? And uh, I didn't. I honestly, I didn't know what to do. It was it was terrifying. And w when we've had earthquakes before, of course, you know, you feel the, the 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 movement back and forth. But today was the first time I ever thought to myself, how much can what is the breaking point, basically, of of a building? It makes you really start to wonder: is it is is it going to get to the point where it it it'll fall down? And those those thoughts did go through my head today. In other news, the founder of World Central Kitchen blames Israel for attacking the charity's vehicle, which killed seven aid workers in the Gaza Strip, including one Canadian-U.S. dual citizen. Jose Andres says the Israeli airstrikes that hit the aid convoy were not an unfortunate mistake. Israel has and had all the right to defend their people. But defending your people is not killing everybody else around. I've been in Gaza myself. I met, and some of the people that died were, were my friends. We were in a deconflicted zone. Uh, we were in a, an area that was highly controlled by IDF. Speaking during a meeting with U.S. Republican members of Congress in Jerusalem, the Israeli Prime Minister said there was a long tradition of the American-Israeli alliance, which he said was more necessary now, not just because of Hamas, but because of the terror access of Iran. That it's more necessary now in the face of the barbarism that uh, we face that uh, threatens our entire civilization. Uh, this is a battle between not only Israel and Hamas, but um, I would say the, uh, the axis of uh, uh, Iran, the terror axis of Iran that seeks to uh, put the Middle East back into the Dark Ages. This is a larger battle. Our battle is your battle. Our victory is your victory. And if, they, if we don't have a victory, this will have enormous implications for American security, for our common uh, future. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in a phone call Thursday that future U.S. support for the Gaza war requires new steps from Israel to protect civilians and aid workers. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby spoke to reporters about it. The president made it clear that our policies with respect to Gaza uh, will be dependent upon our assessment of how well the Israelis uh, make changes and implement changes uh, to, to make the situation in Gaza better for the Palestinian people. And how much time are you giving them to make these changes, to implement these concrete Again, steps? Again, we, we would hope to see some 
announcements of changes here in coming hours and days, and I'll leave it at that. The Canadian federal government plans to launch a $1.5 billion housing fund to protect affordable rentals. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says the Canada Rental Protection Fund will help nonprofit organizations acquire more rental units across Canada and make sure they stay affordable. It's the latest in a series of new housing measures unveiled by the Liberal government in its campaign-style pre-budget tour across the country. Housing advocates have been calling for a mechanism to help nonprofits buy up affordable rentals that might otherwise be sold off to investors. We need more affordable housing buildings just like this one right across the country. Unfortunately, too many of those places are under constant threat of being demolished to build condos or sold to speculators and large corporations that will increase rents at turnover. People are being priced out of their communities and that's not okay. So we have to help nonprofits and community partners acquire units and preserve rents at a stable level. The Canadian Taxpayer Federation says there's a fundamental unfairness about the federal carbon tax because Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is requiring taxpayers in other provinces to pay a higher carbon tax than in Quebec. CTF Director Franco Terrazano joins me now from Ottawa with more details about this. Franco, why do you think Quebec is getting off lighter on carbon tax? The federal government is saying that all provinces are required to impose the carbon tax equally and that carbon pricing is in place across Canada at a similar level of stringency. But that's not what's going on. What's going on is that Trudeau is giving Quebec a special deal on the carbon tax and giving the rest of Canada higher gas and home heating bills. Okay, so, so now in the rest of Canada, uh, the carbon tax is $80 per ton. In Quebec, it's $57 per ton. So what that means is, is if you're in a province like Alberta or Ontario, well, you're paying a carbon tax that is about four cents per liter of gas and diesel more than what's in Quebec. Or you're paying a carbon tax on natural gas that is about five cents per cubic meter of natural gas more than in Quebec. And that carbon tax grow uh, gap sorry, is only expected to grow. So in 2030, the carbon tax in the rest of Canada will be $170 per ton. In Quebec, it's expected to be $97 per ton. Okay, so in 2030, if you're filling up your sedan in like Alberta, well, you'll be paying a carbon tax that's 14 cents per liter of gas more than in Quebec. But Franco, why is he specifically giving this deal to Quebec? It's politics. It's politics, right? This isn't about the environmental science for Trudeau. It's about the political science. For Trudeau. It's just politics. I mean, in the rest of Canada, every other province and every other territory, the carbon tax is $80 per ton. In Quebec, it's $57 per ton, right? It's just that simple. Like, I, I think most viewers who are going to be watching this are going to be like, this is not fair, and they would be correct. So then what's the best solution for this? Well, the solution is simple. Scrap the carbon tax, make it fair for all of Canadians and totally get rid of that carbon tax because the carbon tax is making the necessities of life more expensive. And you know what? Uh, using a tax to make it more expensive for a, a mom to fuel up her minivan to take the kids to soccer practice or a tax that makes it more expensive for seniors to stay warm during the winter months or a tax in Canada that makes it more expensive for all of us to buy food, that is not going to solve a global climate issue. Franco Terrazana, director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, thanks so much for your time today. Well, it was day two of the trial of three men facing charges for their involvement in the 2022 Coots border blockade. Alex Van Herk, Gerard Jansen, and Marco Van Hugenboss have each pleaded not guilty to mischief over $5,000. Prosecutor Stephen Johnson told the jury in his opening statement Wednesday that the three defendants played a key role in blocking the highway at the Canada-U.S. border and that evidence will show the three men were leaders of the blockade and had a final say over what happened happened. During a video played in court, Van Hugenboss and Van Herk uh, refer, uh, referenced 
other blockade arrests, along with the seizure of several weapons and urged protesters to stop what they were doing. Jim Willett, the former mayor of Coots, was called as the first witness in the trial. He testified Coots is only the, the only 24-hour crossing to the U.S. from Alberta and a busy route for truckers and tourists. Willett said he was concerned about the convoy affecting residents' access to grocery stores and medical clinics outside of Coots since the village doesn't have those services. Willett was scheduled to answer questions from the defense during cross-examination Thursday. We will have more about this in the coming days. The trial is scheduled to run until April the 19th. Well, Lethbridge Airport will soon get a boost. The government of Alberta is providing $1.13 $1 million in grants to support the de development of 10 regional airports, including our own Lethbridge Airport. Lethbridge received $150,000 to support a hangar development, feasibility study, and a business case. So the, the hangar uh, feasibility study and business case is the project that we're focused on with this money. Uh, we've heard from our, our area partners in the aviation industry that this is something that's important to them. So we're optimistic that with this work we'll be able to dig in, really find out what the needs of the region are, and uh, be able to put a plan in place to, to activate uh, either some capital money uh, in the long run and or a business plan to develop commercial space out at the airport. Alberta's Minister of Transportation, Devin Dreeshen, says the funding will help the 10 regional airports increase their connectivity and economic competitiveness, including expanding commercial air services, hangar and terminal development. The funded projects obviously vary in scope and size depending on the unique needs of the airports, uh, such as airport certification to support scheduled air services, uh, obtaining customs approval, airport commercial development, commercial air services, hangar development, and development of strategic business cases to restore their position as a regional transportation hub. Now, the projects will also support the business cases to attract new airlines, analyzing highest need routes, determining baseline capacities of airport infrastructure, and identifying capital asset rehabilitation and replacement requirements. In addition to Lethbridge, other airports receiving funding included Red Deer, Medicine Hat, Cold Lake, Fort McMurray, Grand Prairie, High Level, White Court, Lloydminster, and Peace River. The latest public art installation here in Lethbridge does not sit in one spot, but there is only one place you can see it. What is it and where is it? Well, BCN's Naveen Day has those answers. A new public art installation was unveiled Thursday morning at the Logan Boulay Arena. It is called Interwoven Legacies, and it celebrates the impact of the organ donation of the arena's namesake following the April 2018 Humboldt bus crash. Today's event serves as a kickoff to Green Shirt Day, an annual drive for organ donation registration so that others facing losses similar to the Boulay family know that their loved ones will continue on helping others even after death. What was unveiled was two art installations, a mural of pictures covering the exterior windows and a vinyl wrap on the arena's Zamboni. Both of these installations were designed by Lethbridge artist Carla Mather Cox. She says creating the unique design was a tedious task. A black and white photo and then a colored photo was then cut into strips, reorganized, taped, and recut and sorted and taped again. So each photo resulted in a bunch of little tiny tiles that I thought represented the theme of the ripple effect. Um, so it, there was a little bit of process in doing them for sure. Originally envisioned for the exterior of the building was something much larger. However, it would have involved the removal of the exterior stonework. In the fall of 22, the Public Arts Committee and the City called the Lethbridge Historical Society and said that they were hoping to put public art on the building and they wished to speak to us about it. Because one of their first questions was whether or not the stonework on the outside of the building was original to the building and did we mind if they took it off. Sent a letter around to some of our members, particularly those that were concerned with built heritage, and immediately got back the response of, no, 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 no. <laughs> Please don't take the stonework off. Yes, it is original, and yes, it is part of the design that Norm Fuchs did when he designed this building. Since the stonework was deemed to be a character-defining element of the building, it was not removed. 
As for the Boulet family, they are happy with how the new artwork turned out. Logan's father, Toby Boulet, says the family wanted something that people could enjoy looking at over and over. We wanted a piece of art, the committee, that you just don't see once and go, oh, that's nice, and we'll keep walking. It's like, what to do? I, every time I go by the front on the road, the, the windows, or the Zamboni goes by, they see something different, differently. And the parents feel art is a proper way to honor their son. Logan actually, when he was in high school, he took art classes because he contemplated being an architect and so he needed to take art and I think he would really enjoy this because he loved color and he loved to create with different mediums and this would be something that he would be really proud of because it's not just a piece of art it has so much it tells a story. The unveiling comes ahead of Green Shirt Day which is April the 7th. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. Thank you Naveen, beautiful project there. Well, the Lethbridge Hurricanes season has come to an end. The Canes lost game four in double overtime against the Swift Current Broncos Wednesday night. The final score was five to four. Tough break for the Canes. Meanwhile, Western Hockey League announced Lethbridge Hurricanes goaltender Harrison Menigan has been named the 2023-24 Central Division Goaltender of the Year and Lethbridge Hurricanes defenseman Noah Chadwick, who was drafted by the Toronto Maple Leafs in December, has been named the Central Division Scholastic Player of the Year. Way to go, Canes. And in other news, as areas around Ottawa and Montreal saw snowfall warnings Wednesday night into Thursday, wet snow blanketed Montreal today with strong winds sweeping through the streets of old Montreal while slush accumulated at downtown intersections. Well, you know, it's life in Canada, it's life in Montreal. You always, in the springtime, you always have to carry like the four seasons in your, in your, in your bags and it's the way it goes. It doesn't, it doesn't last for very long. In two days, it's going to be all melted. So there you go. Well, it wasn't just Montreal who got dumped on. Alberta has also been sitting under a blanket of white. So it's nice to know we're not the only ones suffering. Misery loves company, I guess. But we do need that moisture. And after the break, I'll be back to tell you how much more moisture we're going to get. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Well, the dump we received on Wednesday night is going to continue at least in Lethbridge uh, right through a Sunday. So we are actually uh, looking at a high of zero on Friday and Friday night. We could see another five to 10 centimeters of snow, if you can believe that. And then into Saturday, also periods of snow high of one degree up to five degrees on Sunday. And that's when we'll see 60% a chance of flurries before things clear up a little bit. For a mix of sun and cloud on Monday, there's the sunshine, hopefully seven degrees for a high that day, up to 15 then on Tuesday, and then 12 degrees on Wednesday. So we're just kind of having to deal with this cold front that's happening in uh, Southern Alberta, bringing all the precipitation average high for this time of year. 10 degrees average low minus 326 was our high temperature back in 1944 and in 1975 we had the chilliest which was minus 18 on this day 7 a.m that is when the sun rose this morning our sun set this evening at 809 giving us 13 hours nine minutes of daylight today on the west coast mainly clearing skies 11 for a high in victoria 14 for a high in vancouver edmonton a high of three degrees looks like snow is going to be clearing up in the morning same thing for california snow overnight and in the morning and then clearing up with a high of one degree uh, in the prairies here uh, Saskatoon looking at a beautiful 13 degrees clear skies Regina lovely as well 17 but up to 70 K winds happening there clear skies as well nice sunny day as well in Winnipeg tomorrow with a high of 11 degrees as we get into the central part of the country we are seeing a mixed bag of precipitation we're seeing uh, showers mixed with flurries in both Toronto and Ottawa five degrees for a high in both of those cities Montreal all seeing periods of snow and periods of rain with a high of four degrees. Uh, quite a bit heavier precipitation happening in Fredericton tomorrow, seeing two centimeters of snow as well as two to four millimeters of rain, three for a high there. Halifax seeing just rain, two to four millimeters of rain, so fairly heavy rains there, five for a high. Six for a high in Charlottetown, seeing a mixed rain and snow and also a freezing drizzle and drizzle in St. John's tomorrow with a high of one degree. So there you have it, that is your forecast. 
Home prices could match a peak levels seen in early 2022 by next year and reach new highs by 2026. The Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation's latest housing market outlook report shows that construction began on nearly 138,000 new units last year across Canada's six largest cities. The report says levels remained in line with the past three years due to a surge of new apartments. Despite an increase in rental housing coming on the market in 2023, CMHC says supply is not forecast to keep up with demand, which will lead to higher rents and lower vacancy rates in the coming years. Rising inflation has impacted the Canadian housing market so much that young home buyers are finding it very difficult to afford a home today. Jeff Reimer, real estate agent from Lethbridge, shares what he's observing with some of his younger clients. The ones that I'm working with, the selection is harder. So you know, they look and then they get discouraged when the one pops up that they can afford where they want and it's sold right away or multiple offers. So that is a bit challenging for them, but they've also had to save up um, their down payment and then qualify at a certain rate. And with the interest rates having gone up, they do qualify for less. So that is a challenge for, so we're seeing a few more people maybe use a co-signer or buy together or pool their resources to accomplish that. And we're seeing, you know, I saw a case here not, not long ago where three generations were involved in the purchase, the grandparent, the parents and the kids, so that they can make it happen. Catch the full interview with real estate agent Jeff Reimer and BCN producer Michael Clausen coming up after business news. Well, the start of electric vehicle production at a Ford plant in Oakville, Ontario has been delayed by two years. Ford Motor Company had planned to start production there in 2025. And while work to overhaul the plant will begin on time this year, the launch of the new three-row electric vehicles to be produced at the factory won't happen until 2027. The company says some of the 2,700 employees will remain on site during the plant transformation, but adds there will be an unspecified number of layoffs. Now here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 60 points on the day to finish at 22,051. The Dow was down 530 points to 38,596. The S&P 500 was down 64 on the day to 5147 and the Nasdaq was down 228 points to finish at 16,049. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up $1.16 to $86.59 U.S. per barrel. Natural gas was down $0.07 cents to $1.77 U.S. Gold was down $9.05 to $2,290.95 U.S. an ounce. And silver was down $0.27 cents to $26.91 U.S. an ounce. Feed wheat is at $8.35 per bushel. Barley's at $6.36. Canola is at $14.29, and corn is at $7.44 per bushel. Live cattle were up $0.55 cents to $181.48. Feeder cattle were up $1.75 to $242.70. Lean hogs were up $0.38 cents to $88.35, and the Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to $73.83 U.S. Recapping one of our top stories, the search for bodies and those stranded continues in Taiwan today following a 7.2 magnitude earthquake that occurred early Wednesday morning. Canadians caught in the country's strong quake, strongest quake in 25 years are describing scenes of chaos, including a shaking so violent and persistent that it moved furniture and required people to crouch down to avoid falling over. Coming up, I speak with Dr. Kelvin Beisner, president of the Cornwall Alliance and co-author of the book Climate and Energy, The Case for Realism, about the ongoing debate on ways to deal with greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. Stay tuned for this interesting conversation. Also, when you see news happening in your community, be sure and send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. There is an ongoing debate and fight over how to deal with greenhouse gas emissions. Many believe climate change is, in fact, a very real and present danger to our world and that it's necessary to spend billions or even trillions of tax dollars to find a solution as quickly as possible. Yet there are others who think we're being somewhat 
alarmists, believing there's a more reasonable point of view. Joining us today from Memphis, Tennessee is Dr. Kel Beisner. He is president of Cornwall Alliance, a conservative Christian public policy group, and the co-editor of a book called Climate and Energy, the Case for Realism. Welcome to Bridge City News, Dr. Beisner. Great to have you on today. Thank you, Jeanette. Great to be back with you. Awesome. Okay, so maybe first off, uh, can you give us a brief overview of your book and what your background is, for that matter? Sure. All right. Well, I'll minimize my background. Okay. Uh, you said I'm president of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. That should be about enough there. <laughs> uh, we're at cornwallalliance.org. Uh, the book is a collection of 16 chapters by actually 16 different authors, uh, nine are climate scientists. A couple of those climate scientists are also economists. Uh, uh, several are energy engineers or energy management specialists. And a couple of them are development specialists. Uh, and so we've tried to bring together all those different perspectives, all those different uh, uh, areas of expertise, so to speak, to do a book that really tries to tries to argue for you know, going down the middle of the road, which I guess means you're gonna get hit by both sides, right? But uh, people tend to think that you have to choose between two perspectives on climate change, either an alarmist perspective, you know, global warming is real, it's driven by human act action almost entirely, it's dangerous to the point of catastrophe, indeed an existential threat, and we have to spend trillions of dollars to try to revamp our entire energy infrastructure around the world in order to slow global warming as much as we can, even if that's only by a tenth or a couple of tenths of a degree Celsius over the rest of this century. And then on the other end of the spectrum, at the other extreme, is the climate change denialist position which says, no, climate isn't changing, global warming isn't real, human activity couldn't pay, uh, contribute to that even if it were real, uh, we don't have to do anything at all, and uh, frankly, uh, it's only the commies who are pushing this thing, <laughs> right? And so you've got the, the denialists and you've got the alarmists on opposite extremes. We've tried to take what is reflected in the title of our book, a, a realistic position, climate and energy, the case for realism. And in our perspective, yes, anthropogenic, that is human induced global warming is real, but it's unlikely to become catastrophic or even significantly problematic. Indeed, the benefits of it may very well outweigh the costs. It, this, this warming could also, by the way, uh, but won't necessarily, be moderated, prevented, or even reversed by a new natural cycle of either warming that would increase it or cooling that would decrease it or reverse it. Uh, we don't know because we don't know exactly when these natural cycles are going to line up to do that, but we do know that they've occurred over and over throughout geologic history. And then the next point is that the cost benefit ratio of adapting to whatever changes in climate come about is far better than the cost benefit ratio of attempting to control global average temperature by reducing our use of fossil fuels and reducing our farming and the use of nitrous fertilizers in farming and so on. Um, and indeed, if we choose adaptation over mitigation, if we decide, okay, we'll, we'll essentially let the warming take place as it does, but we're going to adapt to that by building seawalls to keep seawater out as Holland has done for hundreds of years, right? Or by improving our electric grids so that more and more people can have air conditioning for their homes and so on. Uh, adaptation, is uh, going to make it so that life after climate change is likely to be far, far better than it is before it. Mm -hmm. And yet here we sit with this uh, ongoing debate or even a fight about how to deal with these greenhouse 
gas emissions. And of course, people are saying, follow the science, but anyone who disagrees with the current narrative held by most politicians in your universities seems to get canceled. So is it unreasonable to question the science behind this? And if so, then why? You, you said mm -hmm. that you, you had a number of scientists contribute to the book that yeah. you wrote, right? We have nine climate scientists yeah. contributed to the book, including some of the world's top climate scientists, all of them heavily published in the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, so this is not you know, a, a science denialist <laughs> uh, effort by any means. And the notion of questioning science is not unscientific. It is the very heart of science. Uh, as a Christian, uh, I recognize the contribution of Christianity to the development of scientific method itself. We can actually tie it back to a single verse in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. The Apostle Paul wrote, test all things, hold fast what is good. Well, that's the essence of scientific method. And so uh, for somebody to say, well, there's a consensus and therefore we must all just trust the science is very unscientific. Uh, and instead, what we find is that empirical investigation constantly needs to correct our errors in hypothesis and theory and expectation. You can go back to the Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman and his famous clip uh, available on YouTube also all over the place. Uh, on the key to science. He says, when we try to figure out how something in nature works, first we guess, then we make some predictions based on what, uh, what would happen if the guess were true, then we make observations in the real world. And if the observations contradict the predictions, the guess is wrong, no matter what. That's science. Mm -hmm. Now, let me build just a little more on that, if I may. Sure. I have no problem with the massive scientific assessment reports that come out of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, because those are not alarmist. You'll never find catastrophe, crisis, existential threat, that sort of language in them. And they call for amounts of warming over the next century or two that are frankly well within our ability to adapt and they tell us, actually, the, the 2018 special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius tells us that even if we did nothing to slow global warming, the impact of that warming by the end of the century would only reduce global, uh, gross domestic product, gross global domestic product, but about 2.6% about which would mean that instead of being almost nine times better off than they are now for average people around the world, people would only be about eight and a half times better off than they are now. That's not catastrophe. Okay, so I'm just curious then, because um, you have a number of scientists that contributed to your book, what, what's sort of their consensus? Because we hear this quote sort of like floated around out there that there's 97% consensus on climate change in the scientific community. So where does this number come from and how accurate is it? Well, the, the number comes from uh, most famously a study headed by John Cook at the uh, University of New South Wales, I think, in Australia. And the sad thing is that, frankly, that did a really, really lousy job of framing the issue. Uh, because if you actually pay careful attention at how it was framed, the best you can come up with for a 97% consensus is that global warming is real and human activity contributes to it. Now, I don't deny that. I don't know any climate realist who does deny that. I don't know any climate skeptic who denies that. All of the authors of our book would agree with that. Where you don't get consensus is when you go from there to, yes, and that warming driven by human activity is going to be overall dangerous, indeed catastrophic, even, even an existential threat to humanity and other life on Earth. We have to spend hundreds of trillions of dollars through the remainder of this century to try to reduce that warming. And uh, that means we have to quit using fossil fuels and turn more and more to wind and solar. When you start 
bringing those things in, that so-called consensus just disappears. Uh, and as soon as you attach a, 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 a price tag to any of this, uh, for instance, polls in America will show that Americans generally think that climate change is a very serious problem. Ask them if they still think that when it will cost them as little as a dollar a month extra for their electricity bills, and all of that disappears. And so <laughs> the notion of 97% consensus among scientists on this is just simply not well supported by the data. But besides that, consensus is not science. The whole history of science is a history of one-time consensus being destroyed by new evidence. And uh, so anybody who thinks that scientific consensus demands our submission doesn't know science. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Beisner, we also hear lots about vehicle and factory emissions, but what do you see as the more realistic causes of global warming? Well, um, the sun uh, cycles in solar energy output, uh, solar magnetic wind output, which modulates the influx of cos uh, galactic cosmic rays into the atmosphere, which in turn affect cloudiness, which is very important to determining uh, temperature at the surface of the earth. Uh, those cycles are very important. There are cycles in our oceans, the Pacific, Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, the Atlantic Oscillation, uh, on and on, the, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. All of these different ocean cycles affect global average temperature. Uh, there are additional cycles uh, having to do with the tilt of the earth toward the sun and so on. So uh, all of these are natural cycles. They all contribute. And so, yes, there's a role for greenhouse gases, but it's a relatively small one. Uh, carbon dioxide is the one that usually gets blamed, but every greenhouse gas absorbs heat or warmth only within certain uh, parts of the uh, radiation spectrum. And CO2's parts of that spectrum are almost completely absorbed already by water vapor and the CO2 that was there long before we began burning fossil fuels. What that means is that no matter how much more CO2 we introduce into the atmosphere, it cannot make a big difference in atmospheric temperature. It's like having a window and you, you paint a coat of white paint over that window. Well, that cuts out an awful lot of light, but a little light will still come through. So you do a second coat of white paint. That cuts out most of what's left. You do a third coat and it cuts out a little bit less but there's essentially none, none left. So every coat blocks less sunlight than the previous coat. Same thing with CO2 and other greenhouse gases. And what we forget is that CO2 that has very, very little influence on global temperature has huge influence on plant growth. Plant growth have to have CO, or plants have to have CO2 for photosynthesis. The more of it is in the air in which they're growing, the better they grow. Uh, and that means more food for everything that eats plants or eats something that does eat plants. Consequently, as CO2 concentration rises, food gets cheaper. And that helps the poor around the world more than anybody else. Yeah, so you're saying it could disrupt the ecosystem, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, um, CO2 doesn't disrupt the ecosystem. It actually helps the ecosystem. It, Indeed, what I before mean is the if, if they were to try to get rid of it. Oh, right. Yes, that would be a very bad thing. Reduce it. Yeah, it, it before the Industrial Revolution, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere was around 270 parts per million. At about 200 parts per million, most plants have a much tougher time surviving at all. And at 170 parts, per million, photosynthesis stops. All the plants die, and that means everything else dies. We are blessed 
to have raised CO2 concentration from the 270 parts per million to now about 420 parts per million over the last 200 years or so. That's a really good thing. Uh, and we could go on to double it a couple more times and not raise global temperature by more than a fraction of a degree and have much better growth of plants all around the world. We are out of time, but I do appreciate uh, you being here with us today. Cal, thanks so much. Well, Jeanette, thank you very much. And cornwallalliance.org is the place to go to get a copy, or you can, of course, get it at Amazon, places like that. There you go. Dr. Kel Beisner is the president of Cornwall Alliance and the co-editor of the book Climate and Energy, The Case for Realism, available at cornwallalliance.org. Canada continues to be in a housing crisis, with some markets experiencing a serious shortage of housing. Rising inflation has increased interest rates. Many Canadians, including young married couples, are finding it more difficult to afford a home today. To talk about this in more detail and about the housing market in Alberta is Jeff Reimer. He has been a Lethbridge, Realty, Lethbridge realtor rather, for 30 years with Royal LePage. Jeff, welcome back to Bridge City News. Hey, nice to chat with you, Michael. It's great to have you on. Now, recent headlines say overall the average price of a home of all types in Lethbridge have gone up by an astounding 21.9%. Uh, and that's over this last year. Now, apparently that is almost double the average price increase across Alberta. Could you tell us some of the factors or reasons behind this massive jump? Sure. I mean, it's that, and that, stat that statistic is a little bit um, hard to explain exactly, but it's really a snapshot of January, this January over last January stats. So it is a marked increase, but your average house per se across the board did not go up 22% necessarily. So the statistic is what it is, but um, when you look at the supply and demand issues right now, essentially that's what's driving the prices up. And there's less inventory and people are still moving into Lethbridge, so that's inching the prices up. But the typical house a year ago would not be a full 22% more today necessarily. I mean, some could be close to that. Um, but not all price ranges and not across the board. Right. So what's a young couple or a new family coming to Lethbridge and area to do if they're looking to buy something? Where would you uh, suggest that they start? Well, I mean, definitely get in the market uh, information early and start looking at the data. And depending on your urgency is if you see something you like, act diligently, but act quickly. Yeah, if you wait, you... Uh, especially in the lower price ranges, hmm. you gotcha. know, Lethbridge is average and below. The market can be moving pretty quick if it's a good house or a good uh, condominium or semi-detached home. Right. And they're moving pretty quick. So we, maybe buyers don't have the luxury of location and taking their time. What, what do you say would be the main factor that those home purchasers are looking for? You know, the location is huge. Um, just the other day, I was working with somebody and their preference was a certain area of Lethbridge and they did settle for a different area because the uh, the home was better, but it wasn't their top choice for location. The Lethbridge being, you know, relatively easy to get around in and a quick drive anywhere made it at least possible for them to consider the other options to get in at the price point they needed. So, Right. Now, what about home builders? Is there a lot of new home builds going on in and around Lethbridge? That's an interesting thing that also affects the stats because year over year, there may not have been the same amount of builders or developers putting their product on the MLS system. So that can skew the numbers as well. Like when I look back at, let's say, uh, a semi-detached home selling for on average this January for 364000 I can look back that same stat, let's say in January 2021, and say that it was 209000 Well, that's a drop jaw number difference. But what you're going to find is in in certain developments, 
something like a semi-detached home on the west side of a new construction um, geared to a mature, pop, um, mature buyer could easily sell for 400, 450 developed. And if that product wasn't on the MLS last year, that's quite the skewed difference. So you gotta remember on scale in Lethbridge because of our numbers, it's, it's a snapshot only. So you really have to look at the entire trend and uh, look at examples year over year and uh, you know always just ask your agent for help and counsel on that they like talking about that and giving advice so you know agents are happy to do that yeah so speaking of agents and that research can you kind of talk about the heavy lifting that you do for your clients well every time you spend that much money you're concerned about how much to pay right whether you've done it before or it's your first time um, knowing what price to offer. You look at statistics and, and you look at past sales in the neighborhood and try to guide them on what a fair price would be. But the past doesn't always dictate the current, right? Especially with supply and demand issues. So you can say, well, your neighbor, last two neighbors sold three months ago for X amount. But if there's nothing on the market and they're up for today and there's several people looking for that home, it's it's not as relevant, right? So you really have to gauge your information and have have the agent and the consumer discuss those nuances together candidly and then say, okay, well, how urgent is your purchase? What is your budget? What is your your primary needs and wants? And then weigh that against their desperation motivation of the buyer and then also of the seller. And that's also going to ring true if a seller, let's say, puts it on the market at 5% below market value to try to get you know multiple offers at once. You have to know that. You have to gauge that because if you come in at what you think last month's stats were, you're going to be SOL. So it's really important to, to have the buyer and the agent discuss those prices, discuss the trends, look at the data, discuss it candidly, you know, before making an offer for all purchase. That's really wise. Right. So with this inventory being the way that it is right now, are you seeing a lot of multiple offers on properties? More, certainly. Yeah. Um, if you offer on a place in the first day or two, um, you know, you're always nervous that there could be another one right behind you if there isn't one on the table already. And then certainly in some cases, like, you know, if they do price it um, at or slightly below market, their goal may very well to be get multiple offers. And then, yeah, you're seeing it. Gotcha. I never thought of that. I guess that could be actually a listing strategy is to price it so that you actually do get multiple offers. Now, I wanted to ask you, we've been talking about Lethbridge specifically, but are you seeing more people moving to bedroom communities like Tabor or Barnwell or Nobleford? Absolutely, there's a trend of that. Um, with the interest rates being a little higher, uh, you know, it's to get the same house per se or the same square footage. Yeah, you may not be able to get it in Lethbridge in someone's budget. So they are looking at other places and Places like, yeah, Tabor, Nobleford, Fort McLeod, they're selling quicker in those price points. And what we're finding is we're finding that the prices are compacting. So when the interest rates are higher, the higher houses are, uh, you know, bigger payments. And so people might tend to buy a little more affordable or only qualify for less. And then sellers, when their mortgages come renew here, they're always going to can you know consider whether they need to downsize or lower their expectations for their next house. And then with the demand of new people coming in and the shortage, then the affordable homes are getting pushed up. So you're finding that compacting at the prices. That's a real interesting phenomenon to see, but you're following it when every time you're looking at buying a house, you're going to know those trends. And and yeah, out of town is definitely, um, you know, Lethbridge is still a short drive to any of those communities um, within an hour of here. In some big cities, they go an hour to work every day just across the city. So if someone's moving here from BC, Vancouver, Ontario, you know, in comparison, that drive is not as drastic and it's being considered more and more. Right. Now, mentioning other provinces, are you seeing a lot of buyers from other provinces coming into Southern Alberta? Yeah, certainly there has been that trend in the last couple of years, for sure. Buyers from British Columbia and Ontario, and when they sell a townhouse, for example, at a million, and they can come here and buy a really nice house for 500000 and another revenue property or two with those same funds, it's real enticing for them to consider that. And then if they have young kids, they're going, well, our young kids aren't going to be able to buy in this environment in, let's say, Vancouver, if you grew up there. And so they're considering moving to these, uh, you know, especially after COVID too, right? People wanted to get out of the bigger centers. So it's kind of been a trend the last few years. And uh, Alberta, especially Southern Alberta, offers really good options. Right. 
And circling back to buyer's choices, are you finding that, that there are a lot of people maybe buying revenue properties or going into apartments or townhouses instead of uh, a detached house? Yeah, for sure, because the price per door is less. So uh, you know, a landlord is going to look at the return on investment, mm -hmm. and if they can get in that door for cheaper, the rents are a little higher, right, with inflation. So as we see the rents increase, that, uh, you know, when a, when an owner can put their money into uh, a bond uh, mm -hmm. bond market at such percent, they, they want to get a reasonable return on their property. So if the rents can sustain that, then, yeah, they're buying – those up and it's so it's also putting pressure on the first time market because the landlords are also looking at those and then Lethbridge is still uh, Lethbridge in southern Alberta very much a retirement community because we're nice and warm here and uh, so we're further south and so you're seeing retirement we're seeing new home buyers we're seeing uh, landlords um, investment buyers so you know that's putting a lot of pressure on the lower price points and that's also moving the prices up in those ranges so that being said are you finding that maybe the number of young people buying homes has been decreasing? Are they kind of getting, uh, having too much competition then for those houses that they'd qualify for? Yeah, the exact stat, it would be hard to put a finger on, but yeah, I would say so because the ones that I'm working with, the selection is harder. So you know, they look and then they get discouraged when the one pops up that they can afford where they want and it's sold right away or multiple offers. So that is a bit challenging for them, but they've also had to save up um, their down payment and then qualify at a certain rate. And with the interest rates having gone up, they do qualify for less. So that is a challenge for, so we're seeing a few more people maybe use a co-signer or buy together or pool their resources to accomplish that. And we're seeing, you know, I saw a case here not, not long ago where three generations were involved in the purchase the grandparent, the parents, and the kids so that they can make it happen. Well, that's smart. And that was actually my next question. I was going to ask if you are seeing generations coming together. Uh, and can you talk, are there some advantages? There must be advantages to that. Yeah. And with suites, especially legal suites, where you can get proper insurance and uh, proper conformity with the uh, safety of the city, uh, you know, legal suites are, have quite a big draw as prices go up in any community, right? So legal suites have, have done really well in the city because that need for, for more housing and for affordability and combining, you know, maybe parents on one level, kids on the, up, on the other is becoming a little bit more common and a legal suite does that nicely. So the premium on those has been quite rich and uh, if a builder has taken that step of, of buying a legal suite, or building a legal suite, then you know, the return on that has been reasonable, I think, because of that demand. Yeah, that's really something to keep in mind. I know you and I have talked in the past about the need to make sure that your suite in the house you're looking at is compliant. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Maybe unpack that, why the, the buyer needs to pay a little bit more attention to some of those nuances. Yeah, it's a choice of the risk tolerance of any particular buyer. You know, ultimate best if everything was perfect according to codes, but there's a lot of illegal suites in Lethbridge. And so much so that a lot of brokerages are requiring their agents to put the words illegal right in the advertisements. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not safe, but they were probably not to code and they may not be safe or they may not have all the elements of safety. So, you know, there's a lot more to it than just the zoning or the application or egress windows, right? There's alarm systems, there's, there's the width of steps, there's proper parking, there's the actual zoning, um, smoke detectors, you know, firewall, uh, heat sources, size of windows. You know, it's not just about being able to get out, but firemen are able to get in. So people ask, oh, do I just need to do bigger windows? Well, it's a lot more than that usually. And the city had a program before where you could take non-compliant places if you could prove in the past that they had been rented out and bring them into a safety minimum mm -hmm. target with uh, you know fire codes and such and that program as i understand has ended so a few years back now so if you're going to want to make a suite that you're going to be uh, necessary as i understand it to bring it up to legal duplex standards which could mean two heating sources and uh, making sure the zoning's proper and everything yeah well and even fire blocking like there's 
you know, in looking at this, and you and I have talked about this before, even the liability issue of, of keeping your tenants safe and wanting what's yeah, best Yeah, there's for a them. fire, right? You yeah. want to make sure that your insurance is going to cover mm -hmm. you, uh, and you certainly just don't want a fire. Right? Absolutely. Horrible. So you, you want to avoid that at all costs, and that's why we have codes, right? So that's it is right. important to follow. In a perfect world, everything would be legal. Um, so it's something to consider, and certainly don't hesitate to talk to the city because they're the experts on that, and... Talk to a contractor, mm -hmm. talk to your agent about it, check with the city. They can give you the information on a particular property of whether, you know, where it's at with that and then make your decisions based on that. That's right. And as hard as it may be to believe for some people, the city does actually have the property owner's best interests in mind. Yeah, with, for sure. Right. They All they want is safety. Mm -hmm. They want neighborhoods that are, uh, you know, attractive and That's aren't right. overcrowded. So it does come down to zoning and density and all those things too in the city's plans. And the city wants to make housing available for people. So, you know, they'll they'll work with homeowners as much as possible to get the, you know, the best density that a neighborhood can support. That's right. So as we wrap things up, there apparently are rumors that interest rates could be coming down. Do you have any predictions as to where the Southern Alberta real estate market is headed in 2024? Yeah, I mean, things are steady. People are moving in. The rates at least are holding pattern right now. Talk of them coming down. So, yeah, I would say it's still it's encouraging for Southern Alberta. Prices should do well and fairly stable. And Lethbridge, is a, Lethbridge and area um, has always been a very stable market. You know, we don't react quite as drastically to the oil, but it still affects us, but less proportionately and less um, quickly. So, yeah, it's it's a good time right now to own a house. It's a little more challenging to buy, but still some good opportunities. And the prices are still reasonable in relation to other communities. You look at the prices and um, you know, Vancouver, Toronto, and, you know, it's just not affordable for a lot of people. So great place to live here in Lethbridge and uh, yeah. exciting times. Jeff, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you for the opportunity here. to discuss with you, Michael. Have a great day. That was Jeff Reimer. He has been a Lethbridge realtor for 30 years with Royal LePage. For all of us here at Bridge City News, I'm Michael Claussen. Thanks for watching.